Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. This uh, this week, uh, what I'd like to do is last week we had discussed the first verse in the Shema, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokeinu Hashem Echad. Hear O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one. This week I would like to continue with the second verse of the Shema and then the first paragraph, the Ahavta. Now the second verse in the Shema reads, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Liolam Vo'ed which translate to mean, may his holy name be blessed forever and ever. And the question becomes, why his name? Why not God himself? So in reality, we have no idea who or what God is. It is impossible for a human being to comprehend a supreme being. We are limited by our corporeality. At best, we can only know God by his name, much like a person of stature. You may know his name, but his true essence is not readily visible and may even be well incomprehensible to the average person. If you look into the Torah in the book of Devarim in the portion of Vo'et Hanan, 6 verses 4 through 9, you will notice that this verse is not mentioned in Baruch Shem. So what is the origin of these words that we say? In addition, when we say the verse Baruch Shem, it's interesting, but we say it quietly. The question is why. There is a medrash that says that when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses was on the top of the Mount Sinai receiving the Torah, he heard the angels singing praise to God, and there he heard the verse of Baruch Shem. He thought that it was totally appropriate that we should also say these words. And so he, so to speak, plagiarized the words of the angels. When he descended from the mountain, he added the verse to the Shema, but he told the people that he had stolen it from the angels without their knowledge, and that people should say the words, but quietly, so that it would remain hidden. We do see, that is, that the only time that we actually articulate this verse is on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, a year when we act like angels. We don't eat or drink, we dress in white, and we spend the day in prayer and supplication to the master of the universe, God Almighty. We become angelic, and we earn the right to say the verse out loud. We are, at least for the day, not considered as thieves for saying the verse. Now, the first paragraph of the Shema begins with the words, the Ahavta, and you shall love Hashem Elokech, the Lord your God. There are three levels of serving God. Fear, love, and awe. The lowest level is fear. People fear that which they don't know. Fear many times comes really from ignorance, a lack of knowledge. It also comes from a concern about being punished for disobedience. One can comply with a command not because they see or understand the benefit, but only because they fear the consequences. The saying goes, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. The next level in our service of God is love. Love develops through knowledge and time. In marriage, people say that they marry for love. What they really get married for is infatuation. Love is something that develops from laughter and tears. It is earned. Love is a result of knowledge. You can't truly love that which you do not know. So when the Torah commands us, the Yahavta Hashem Lokecha, to love the Lord your God, it is really a declaration that we are commanded to search, to study, to try to connect with our Father in Heaven. As Rashi states, one cannot compare him who acts out of love to him who acts out of fear. The more that we know about God and His universe, the more that we realize that He is the one who directs everything. Again, the world is just a computer program and God is the ultimate programmer. He is our benevolent Father and He loves and cares for each one of us individually. When we understand this fact, then we automatically feel more love and affection towards Him. Now, loving God is not just for us, but it is a command for us to act in a way that others will love God because of our example. So in reality, we are ambassadors of God. 
With the knowledge that we acquire through our efforts to know God and reach the conscious level of loving him, we automatically develop a deep sense of awe as we connect to him on deeper and deeper spiritual levels. Hasidus teaches us that for one to attain a balanced relationship with God Almighty, we must have two ingredients, either fear and love, or preferably, love and awe. Hasidus compares our relationship with God Almighty and his Torah as to the wings of a bird. And for a bird to be able to fly, it must have the balance of two wings. One wing will not allow the bird to get airborne. So, in our relation, so too in our relationship with God Almighty, it must be balanced. Again, it requires boundaries. <clears throat> Excuse me, the voice states, Hakol bidei shemayim chutz miyirat shemayim. That everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. So, the question becomes, is our relationship with God all based on fear? Is that what he really wants? Now, I found an explanation of this verse that makes much more sense. Our most powerful prayers are not when we beseech God's assistance as the king of the universe or as the omnipotent being, but rather as a loving father. We begin one of our most powerful prayers with the words of Vinu Malkenu, our father, our king. First and foremost, father. So what does fear of heaven really mean then? It's not about our fear of God, but rather his concern and fear that we as his children will not make the right choices in life, <clears throat> much like any loving father concerned about their children. But again, how can the Torah command us to love God? Love is an emotion. Maybe we won't be able to feel that love. The Sfasema states that the mitzvah should not have been a command, be seen as a command to have an emotion, but rather as a command that we allow an already natural existing emotion to express itself. How are we to understand this statement? The Torah commands us to honor and respect our parents, not love. The question is why? The answer goes back to creation. When Adam first man was created, he had no parents, only God Almighty himself. And so he was created with a natural love for God. In fact, before the destruction of the first temple, the greatest temptation in the world was idol worship. In order for our existence in this world to have meaning, we must have the ability to choose between good and evil. And these emotions have to be equal Otherwise, there is really no choice. So after the destruction of the first temple, the men of the great assembly, the Anshikinesis Agdola, prayed to God that he remove the temptation of idol worship from the world because it seemed to be too great a test for man to overcome. And God agreed to their request and removed that desire from the world. However, once he removed the desire for idol worship, <clears throat> He also removed the desire and tangible feelings of love for God. So deep within all of our beings is a real and tangible love for God. We just have to dig deep within our souls to attach to it. Much like any treasure found in nature, gold, silver, diamonds, oil, even water. These treasures can be acquired, but only with hard work. One has to dig deep. Our relationship with God is connected with our relationship with our fellow Jews. We are one nation, one body, one soul. We are all God's firstborn. We have a responsibility not only to him, but also to each other. The words, V'yahavta es Hashem Elokecha, and you shall love the Lord your God, has a numerical value of 907. The same numerical value as the words, V'yahavta l'reyachu k'mocha ani Hashem. And you shall love your friend as yourself, I am God. So the mitzvah of loving a fellow Jew is found in the third book of the Torah, in the book of Vayikra, in the portion of Kedoshim, 1919. 
And the mitzvah of loving God is only mentioned in the fifth book of the Torah, in the portion of Vo'et Hanan, chapter 6, verse 5, to teach us that the only way one can achieve true love of God is by first achieving the level of loving your fellow Jew. And that is why the Arizal says we proceed our prayers to God in the morning with the words, Hareini Mekabolai, Mitzvah shall be a kamocha. That I accept upon myself the positive commandment of loving my friend as myself. Now the paragraph continues that one should love as Hashem Elokecha, the Lord your God. That the love we feel towards God should be the same whether he deals with us on the level of mercy, Hashem, or strict justice, Elokecha. It then continues with the command to serve him. With all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Now the word, excuse me, your heart, is plural. It should actually be lev, heart, singular. We only have one heart. Rashi explains the term, with all your heart to mean that with your two inclinations, our Yetzirah, our evil inclination, and our Yetzirah Tov, our good inclination. Rashi adds, your heart should not be divided against the omnipresent. But with, why with both of your inclinations? What challenge is there in serving God with your Yetzirah Tov, your good inclinations? The answer is being able to decide what mitzvah takes precedence, knowing which mitzvah to do at which time. Also to harness the power of the Yetzahara, the evil inclination to do good. As it states in Tehillim in Psalm 34, verse 15, Sun meirave ase tov, turn away from evil and do good. So the sun meira, the turn away from evil, alludes to the Yetzah tov, a nerd who is passive and doesn't sin. The, the viase tov, and do good, alludes to the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, a wild and fun-loving person who is full of energy. It is our mission in life to blend the goodness of the Yetzirah tov and the enthusiasm of the Yetzirah to form one dynamic individual. The word bekol, pardon me, Bechol, has the same numerical value as the word Ben, son, which is 52. This alludes to the fact that we should serve God with the same love that a son has for his father. Uvachal nafshecha, and with all your soul, Rashi states, that the nafshecha, your soul, means even if he were to ask you for your soul, to give up your life, which alludes to the concept of Mesirat Nefesh, giving up one's life for God. V'choma odecha, and with all your might, Rashi states, that this is interpreted as with all your possessions. And this alludes to whatever a person sees as precious, which to most people is their money. Rabbeinu Bachai states, these three terms, ha'v'chol avavachol nafshachol miodecha, allude to the three avot, and the way that they serve God. With all your heart, alludes to Avinu, Abraham, our father, who served God with all his heart, not only with the service of God, but also by influencing many people to convert and share in his love of the Creator. With all your soul, alludes to Yitzchak Avinu, Yitzchak, our father, who was Mesir at Nefesh, being able, willing to give up his life, offering his life for God. He showed that he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, giving up one's life. He allowed his father to bind him on the altar so that he could be brought up as an offering to God Almighty. And with all your might, this alludes to Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, who showed his love to, but to God by vowing to give a double tithing of everything that he would earn, going so far as to even tithe one of his children Levi. He loved God with all his possessions, with everything that was precious to him. 
Now how can someone show that he is really ready and willing to give up his life for God? Now, since a person's money is as important to him as his life, me'odecha, by spending money on tzedakah, charity, and other mitzvot, he shows that he would even give up his life if needed for Kiddush Hashem, for sanctification of God's name. The paragraph continues with the words, And these words which I command you these, this day, that these words are a direct command from Anochi, from God Almighty Himself, the King of Kings. And as Rashi states, let them not be in your eyes like antiquated ordinances, which nobody follows, but like a recent command towards which everyone is excited to fulfill with an alacrity, brand new each day. Allah upon your heart, that you should rule over your heart and not have your heart, your emotions, rule over you. The Kutzka, the Menachem Mendel of Kutsk, also states that the verse is saying that these words are resting al, on your heart, not internalized. However, one should not be concerned since the time will come when you'll feel a deep love and inspiration, and then they will surely enter into your heart. Perseverance, just stay the course. And you shall teach them to your children, and you shall speak about them. Your children is really singular, to your child. The Torah here is referring to a child who is sharp and perceptive. Now in the second paragraph of the Shema, the same thing is stated again, but in the plural, alluding to all children, even those who are not as bright. No, no child should be left out. This is also alluded to with the words, Vishinantam, teach gently. And Medibarta, speak firmly. Teach each child according to their nature and ability. One would have thought that first you speak about them and then you teach them to your children. The verse is telling us that even if you have no Torah knowledge, no education, give your child a Torah education and then speak to them about what they have learned and together, together you'll both grow. More than we bring up our children, we bring up ourselves. In addition, giving your children a Torah education, v'shinan t'levanecha, bridges what we call the generation gap. V'dibarta bum, and you shall speak in them. You now have something to discuss with your children. An 85-year-old scholar and a 5-year-old child are both learning the same book. And this is alluded to by the word bum. The base alludes to the first word of the written Torah, Bereshit, and Mem alludes to the first word of the oral Torah, Me'emotai. From when do we recite the Shema? Again, a sea of knowledge to discuss. The word Bum has numerical value of 42. The Holy Baal Shem Tov said that just as the Jewish nation had 42 different journeys in the desert, so too, each one of us will experience 42 journeys, challenges in our lives. And these 42 challenges define our lives. They depict our journey in life. And it's important that parents pass on to their children the stories of their journeys, the details surrounding their failures and ultimate successes, and especially how they now in hindsight are able to see clearly the hand of God in all of their life experiences. The paragraph continues with, When you're sitting in your house, and when you're walking on the road, and when you lie down and when you get up, as a continuation of the last thought, that wherever you are and whatever you do, you will always have something interesting to speak about with your children. These words teach us that the time for expressing our commitment to God Almighty and His Torah is everywhere and at all times. One should not serve God differently when he travels than when he is at home. 
one's level of religiosity should be consistent. Day or night, place or time, are not the criteria that decide what are the serv what our service of God should be. Only God and the laws of the Torah decide that. It continues with the mitzvah of tefillin. Ukshartam laot totofot bein einecho. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. The tefillin are connected to the words of the Jewish nations that they said to God on Har Sinai, on the mountain. Nasev nishma, we will do and we will listen. The hand tefillin are connected to the word naase, we will do, action. The tefillin of the head are connected to the word nishma, we will listen, thought. It's interesting that both the hand and the head tefillin contain the exact same four paragraphs from the Torah. The difference between them is that in the tefillin of the head, the four paragraphs are in four separate compartments. Whereas the tefillin of the hand, all four paragraphs are ro rolled up together in one scroll. There's a great lesson for us to learn here. When it comes to thoughts about God and observing his commandments, we all have different ideas. This is alluded to by the four compartments of the head tefillin. Different thoughts at different times and different places. However, when it comes to action, actually performing the actual mitzvah, alluded to by the single scroll in the hand tefillin, there is only one way for us to fill our obligation. We must follow the law as dictated to us by the Torah. We cannot innovate. The paragraph ends with the verse, Uksavtam muzot beis techo visharecho, and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. With the word me'odecha, your might, we dealt with one's wealth. Here the verse adds that what we might refer to as what we call stuff, all of our physical possessions. House is mentioned to allude to stuff since the lion's share of most people's net worth is their house. But it includes anything, again, that you own. The mezuzah is really a spiritual alarm system. It contains the first two paragraphs of the Shema. On the outside of the parchment, the name of God, the Shin Dalad Yud, which we pronounce Shakai, we, we substitute the Dalad for a Kuf, probably the other way, a Kuf for a Dalad. The name God is connected to the Hebrew word Dai, enough. When God created the world, in the beginning of creation, it continued to expand until he said the word die, enough. And it's also an acronym for three letters of the word that stand for Shin, Shomer, Dalet, Delet, Yud, Yitroel. That he who guards the doorpost of Israel. With that, we have finished an overall understanding of the first paragraph of the Shema. And with that, may we help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sekenu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for coming.